Food bloggers, hi, how are you today? Thank you so much for tuning in to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. This is the place for food bloggers to get information and inspiration to accelerate your blog's growth and ultimately help you to achieve your freedom, whether that's financial, personal, or professional. I'm Megan Porta, and I've been a food blogger for over 12 years. I understand how isolating food blogging can be at times. I'm on a mission to motivate, inspire, and most importantly, let each and every food blogger, including you, know that you are heard and supported. Creating content that makes our user feel valued and included, I think, is so important to all of us. Some of us, myself included, just need a little bit of education about ways to do that. And in this episode, Jasmine Woodard from Dash of Jazz does exactly that. She talks about creating inclusive content within your niche so that as many people as possible feel included and feel valued. This is episode number 407, sponsored by Rank IQ. Eat Blog Talk is here to support you at every stage of your food blogging journey to help you accelerate your blog's growth so you can achieve your freedom. We offer many services that will help get you on the right path no matter where you're at in your journey. Don't forget to check out our free discussion forum at forum.eatblogtalk.com. Go there to connect with like-minded peers, to learn and to grow, and to share any wins that you have. Our signature service is our mastermind program. We are currently accepting waitlist submissions for 2024. So if you want to get on the list for this year-long experience starting in January 2024, definitely do that now. If you are not quite ready for that investment, the Mini Minds program might be for you. It is a six-month program that will help you achieve your goals and overcome any obstacles that are holding you back. And if you're up for getting together in person with some like-minded food bloggers, consider coming to one of our in-person retreats in 2023. This is a great way to get to know your fellow food bloggers really well in an intimate setting to learn a ton about food blogging in a short time frame and to eat some delicious food that you will never forget. Go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash services to get all the information about all of our services. Jasmine has balanced growing her food and travel blog Dash of Jazz with a corporate career in DEI for the last eight years. In this time, Jasmine has learned how to be inclusive in her content approach without alienating her niche audience. She has also cultivated an audience that engages with both food and travel content. Hi, Jasmine. How are you today? Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Hi, Megan. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. And of course, very glad to be here. Yay, I'm excited to have this very important chat today. But first, we want to know if you have a fun fact to share. Yes, I think the most fun fact of all about me is that I'm the oldest of five kids. I have two sisters and two brothers, and like they range in age with distance from me, like two to 13 years younger than me. So I come by like bossiness very honestly. Oh, you come by the bossiness. I was just going to ask you, do you fall into that typical role of oldest child? Yes, definitely. Yes, you're like, yes, I do. (laughs) Oh, I love it. That's a lot of siblings to have, but Mm -hmm. very awesome fun fact. Okay, you're here today, Jasmine, to talk about a very important topic, creating inclusive content within your niche. So would you mind just talking through your, you know, your first few years of blogging, I know that you kept your career, you had two careers really segmented and didn't really consider the whole DEI aspect. So we would love to just hear that story and how it's evolved and where you're at now. For sure. So I launched my food and travel blog, Dash of Jazz, eight years ago, about eight years ago, within a week of also starting my career in corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion within HR. And for the first few years, I kept them completely separate, like compartmentalized. And it was mostly because Dasha Jazz was like a creative outlet for me. I think like many bloggers, I started it not really thinking about eventually monetizing and making it a business, but it was really at the like urgent request of friends and family members who wanted my recipes and were dispersed all over the country, all over the world. And I promised that I would start posting them online. So it was really, truly just like an online kind of recipe diary. And then eventually a travel diary as well as I started traveling a lot, primarily solo to new places. And so I didn't really think about it through a DEI lens at first. And so it was a few years in when I started writing travel content, actually, that it became more top of mind because I I try to approach my 
travel, whether that's like how I'm planning a trip or taking notes during the trip. And then of course, eventually writing about it. I do try to approach that through a lens of inclusion and from like a posture of learning because I don't want to position myself as an expert on a place where I don't live. And I also don't want to like reinforce stereotypes or unethical travel or consumption. I try to always be very respectful of the people and places that are having me as a guest, really, even though I am a guide or teacher to my readers. So it was very easy to think about inclusion from that standpoint. And then once I started evolving uh, Dash of Jazz into more of a brand and more of a business, I started really looking at where I could be more inclusive with my content and the things that I was implementing in my day job began to kind of overlap with what I was implementing by night with my website. So interesting. And then I just had the thought as you were talking, like, how do you promote things through the travel lens, for example, without being seen as an expert? Because I think that would be really hard because you go somewhere and you're like, this restaurant or this food or this whatever fill in the blank was great. Like, I think that we tend to assume that the person talking about it is an expert. So how do you draw that line? Yeah, so I try to draw comparisons, which I'm fortunate to have like a very large body of content eight years in. It was harder (laughs) at the beginning, but I do try to draw comparisons and interlink and reference people to other things like, oh, if you enjoy, you know, this recipe, you would probably like this dish, insert restaurant here, because, you know, they have a similar flavor profile. I'm also very transparent about the fact that I grew up with a mother with chronic illness. And so some of the diet modifications that she had to implement to stay well, naturally, like became just part of how we ate. So like very low salt and things like that. So most of my recipes say like to taste or to preference, because it really is based on preference, I might think something salty that another person might not. And the same same thing with the destination. So I try to position myself as a, a teacher to my readers with the content. But I also do include like caveats or just notes kind of illuminating why I found something to be this way, rather than just saying, it's a great restaurant, I would say it was my favorite restaurant from the trip. And here's why. So that someone can make their own determination based on, well, even though Jasmine liked it, the reasons that she said she liked it, aren't really what I'm looking for, you know, for a a nice dinner. So I'm going to go with this other recommendation that she made instead. You're expressing your opinions about the food, the restaurant, the whatever. And I think that we can all adopt this same mentality with food blogging, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we talk about food, I mean, depending on what your niche is, from all parts of the world. And I think just expressing opinions, like what you just said, like I love this food because here's what I love about this recipe and just putting it on your opinion, your preference. Right. Okay. So then you realized this was important and you started incorporating this into your blog content, right? And then did this carry over also to social media? Yeah. So it actually, Megan, started with social and then went over to blog. So I think just a very easy thing is when Instagram and other platforms rolled out captions for videos. I was using a third party app to caption my videos for a while before Instagram caught up. But that was just something I tested out and tried, got tons of feedback from people that were very grateful that I was using captions. And so I continued to do it. And then when Instagram eventually rolled out their feature, that made it even easier. Image descriptions are another thing where it's just simply typing up a a couple of sentences or one sentence in the captions for all of my content to say what's going on, essentially for someone who isn't able to visually consume the image. And so I then kind of carried that over to my blog. And so image descriptions, alt text, I think I've been blogging for eight years. And I know there was a time where we were all or many of us were using alt text for like our Pinterest descriptions. (laughs) And so that's something that I'm still cleaning up for some posts. But that was a very like easy entry point to start considering how can I make my content as widely accessible and inclusive of as many people as possible within my niche, right? Like this isn't about trying to reach every single person or trying to like please everybody, but ensuring that every person has 
an equal opportunity to enjoy the content regardless of uh, their differences. Oh, I love that standpoint. That's so amazing. And I think this is something, especially on social media, that not a lot of us think about. Maybe it's just me, but we all hear like it's so important to go into WordPress and to put that alt text on your images, right? But we don't, or at least I don't often think to do that on Instagram, but do you get feedback from that? Do you hear that it's really helpful from people in your niche? So the image descriptions, I haven't heard a ton of feedback is something I more recently have implemented. But when I do get feedback on the different inclusive measures, it's always so touching and almost overwhelming because although maybe 10%, it might impact 10% of my audience, the people that it does impact, it's a major impact for them. It's very, it's not common and a lot of content creators and bloggers are probably not, as you said, thinking about all of these things. So their content does have barriers for folks that it's easy to overlook. So people really do feel seen and included and valued, which if you're thinking about it from a business standpoint, does drive loyalty. But that's just kind of a benefit. That's not really the the intention behind it. But people that do feel included by those measures really feel included. It makes a huge difference to them to come across something that they can actually feel like they are able to take full part in when there's not a lot of that going on. So instead of seeing it as like something to check off your to-do list, I have to go fill in all of my alt text, Mm -hmm. seeing it as a way to help people feel valued and to feel included, which that is such a small perspective change. But I can see that making a world of difference, not in just who you're serving, but how you are offering up your value as well, don't you think? Yeah, I agree. And and I think that the thing with alt text specifically is it, it helps me to make sure that like my images aren't too repetitive. I, I think we've all really internalized or hopefully soaked up a lot of the knowledge that Casey Marquis has been sharing about not having 30 hero images, right? Or 30 Im- images of the same thing throughout a blog post. And when you have to write alt text describing what's in each of your photos and you have three photos in a row that you're struggling to describe differently from each other because they're essentially the same. It also reinforces for you to make sure that you are curating your content very Mm. thoughtfully. So that's another like fringe benefit. Mm, That's interesting. So that's probably like a little red flag if you're (laughs) writing the same description the three times in a row, you're like, wait a second, I need to go back. What am I actually publishing? Yeah. I never thought of it like that. So covering all the bases. So we're talking like social media, just making sure you're including everyone there, your blog, like captions and alt text. What other ways can we make people feel included that we're not thinking of? Yeah. So I try to invest in a lot of continuing education uh, as part of my day job. But once I realized that you know, there's a connection to blogging. I'm looking at it through that lens as well. And so Casey Marquis is a great resource. I also have taken some courses on LinkedIn learning, including one specifically about creating inclusive digital content. So if you have access to LinkedIn learning, I highly recommend it. SHRM, which is the Society of Human Resource Management, has great resources. And so does Tastemaker Conference, which we just came from. They're starting to do a lot of great sessions on DEI and content creation. But I think that, so one of the things that I learned from those variety of resources was specifically about links. And so when I'm going through updating a blog post or even just about to hit publish on a new one, in addition to checking for like broken links or making sure that I have a balance between like my internal and external linking, right? I check to make sure that my links clearly indicate where they lead, which is a good accessibility best practice. So instead of saying, click here and here is hyperlinked. And then the rest of the words say to get my spice banana nut bread recipe, the whole link could say, get my spice banana nut bread recipe. And that's what's linked so that the person using a screen reader or other assisted device knows that that's where this link is going to lead me instead of the link saying it's going to leave you here, quote unquote. So really the inclusivity could be just like not hiding anything, just being upfront about what you're offering. Yeah. I love that. And that is good practice for SEO too, just having a variety of really good anchor text. It's not just like click here because 
that doesn't tell anyone anything. Your user or Google, it's people have to like research, like where am I clicking? So I love that as a best practice. Let's take a quick break because I would love to chat about my favorite keyword research tool, Rank IQ. One of my favorite strategies with this tool is to write really robust, helpful, and informative non-recipe content that actually helps to add value to people's lives and also supports and lifts up my own existing content. Let's talk through an example. Chili. Since the beginning of my blog, people have swooned over my chili recipe. Up until I discovered Rank IQ, I thought that writing supportive content for chili meant creating more chili recipes. So I have about a million chili recipes on my blog and guess how much traction most of them have gotten? Little to none. Then I met Rank IQ and the way I approach supportive content completely changed. Instead of looking for a hundred different ways to make chili, I looked for information about chili that would round out my users' experiences. A few examples of non-recipe chili content that I've written that have done really well are what sides go with chili, how to freeze chili, substitute for beans and chili, and I have so many more. I could go on and on. Now when my user browses through my chili post, they will need all of this other information and sometimes a single H2 followed by a few sentences about that topic just is not enough. This is also a great way to let Google know that I am a chili expert. It's a win all around. It helps the user. It improves the quality of our content. It helps us more traffic and trust. And it also helps solidify our budding relationships with Google. Go to rankiq.com to get started. Now back to the episode. I also think about the language. So 80% of my audience is women. My reader persona is a woman. And so I sometimes use terms like girl or sis in my copy. And that's just, you know, kind of the way of being intimate with my readers. And my male identifying readers actually get that. But when I'm scanning for my copy, I do want to make sure that the way I'm writing an article doesn't imply that cooking is only for women because it's truly for everyone. So that's something that I'm thinking about as well. I I think it is impossible to please everyone, but there are some things that we can do to make sure we aren't unintentionally alienating a person. Mm. So just being really intentional with our language. And I also make sure that I'm not incorporating stereotypes or harmful language into my content. So labeling something as generally Asian, for example, because it uses certain recipes may, you know, may not be appropriate. So I I do try to also do a lot of research to avoid that, but also thinking about stereotypes. We see a lot of recipes that are called like crack cookies or crack bars or, you know, insert dish here, or even the term addictive. Like the point is to try to communicate just how delicious that recipe is. And I think that we can be more creative in doing so without kind of making light the crack epidemic, for example, or people who are currently like heavily impacted by the opioid crisis, where to someone who is very closely related to that, that can be painful for them. And I think we can we can get the same message across. Yeah, I think that that's something, again, like a lot of us don't think about. And I just recently, this came to light for me because I was researching RPMs and why some of my posts can be really low RPMs and some really high. And it came to my attention that if you do use some of those terms like addictive, which I used to write that word all the time to describe my food, or I think I do have, I think I changed it, but crack brownies. And I just didn't think of that. And I feel like, oh my goodness, why was I not considering that? But now I'm like, of course, that's why the people serving up the ads maybe don't want their company associated with something like that. So just being aware. And I think that's why these conversations are so helpful because honestly, a lot of us don't even consider this, but once you bring it to our attention, we're like, of course, that makes total sense. So what are some other things that maybe we're not thinking about? So alluding to drugs or yeah, just anything else that comes to mind for you? Yeah. And I had Megan, an addictive massage kale recipe on my blog for years. I mean, the recipe is still there, but I've obviously changed the name. And when I thought about it as well, from an SEO standpoint, you know, are people really searching for an addictive salad recipe? Probably not. So, you know, I had to put some thought to how to describe it in a more meaningful and accurate way. And it is one of the most popular recipes on my site year over year, especially since since making some of those changes. But I think another piece 
that's related to the conversation of just inclusion in food blogging is the concept of like colonizing recipes or colonizing cultural foods. And it's something that we talked about at Tastemaker Conference this year, where we all have exposure and experience to a variety of foods that maybe we don't have a close personal cultural connection with. Like it's not something that maybe our parents taught us to make growing up, but something that we tried at some point in life and enjoyed. And so I I think about that as well when I'm conceptualizing recipes or really, I think like most of us will get inspired when I'm eating out or just kind of, you know, trying new things in addition to like keyword research. And I often will eat something at a restaurant and think like, oh, I could make this or I could make this in a different way. So I think that really embedding that like cultural curiosity or that, that curiosity and questioning of ourselves when we are as part of our recipe research is helpful. So having recipes on your site that come from another culture, I think can be done well, if you are intentional about the research. So conveying the origins and and the significance of the recipe in your copy, linking to more authoritative authors that might have that connection, and being sure to clarify where your recipe is not traditional or authentic and talking about why you've made those changes. And one thing for me, I just asked my, myself the question at the very beginning is, do I need to develop this recipe? Like, does it exist, you know, already in a more authentic way? Usually the answer is yes. So I typically will just make something for my own enjoyment rather than publishing it. But when you do, I think that some of those things that I outlined can be helpful in addition to avoiding using words like elevating or discovering or making something better. Because when we think about many recipes, there's a phrase where it's like, there's nothing new under the sun. So many things have been done. We just may not know about them, but that doesn't mean that they're unknown or hidden. They're probably everyday part of life for someone on the other side of the world, for example. So just making sure that we aren't positioning ourselves as experts on the cuisine if we're not, but also not implying that the cuisine or the particular dish needed to be improved. Mm, That's such a good point. Maybe like to our tastes, right? Like I catered this to my liking instead of like I'm elevating this, this dish because I can see that being really offensive to a lot of cultures who have put so much blood, sweat, and tears and love into creating these recipes. And then someone who tastes it a handful of times comes along and like, I'm going to make this better. So that just thinking about that and doing a self audit and realizing that how offensive that could be to people, I think is what you're saying. So speaking of self audit, do you have a process that you go through? So you mentioned that you kind of ask yourself, like, do I need to create this? Do you have anything else that you do that keeps you on track? Yeah. So, I mean, I think part of the research that we do keyword research and just like Google searches to see what's out there. I always start there to give myself a grounding in what does the landscape for this recipe look like if it is something that I want to pursue, not only from like a competitive standpoint, but from a standpoint of like, are there things I need to be sensitive of? So building that lens into my research, but also I I think even on a more practical piece In the recipe development, I know something that we always hear about making the content as helpful and as useful as possible for the reader is about providing alternatives or providing just as much information as possible before someone actually gets started so that they know what substitutions they can make, what kinds of tools do they need to have on hand. I try to think about that from an accessibility lens as well, not necessarily only accessibility based on physical ability or mental ability, but also just where you might be located in the world. My cultural background is that my dad is Nigerian. He immigrated here in his 20s. And my mom is a Black American. So her family, her side of the family has been in the U.S. for many generations by virtue of the transatlantic slave trade. And so there are some intersections in those cultures in the food, but there are also a lot of very strong distinctions. And so I cook lots of Nigerian dishes for my website, but I don't position myself as an expert on Nigerian food because it's an entire country that I'm not, you know, is not my home, although it does feel like home. And also the way that I'm making things in the States 
can vary a lot from how someone in Nigeria or in another part of the world with Nigerian roots or interest might make it just by virtue of what products are available to me and what they're called. So that's something that I, I try to think of when I am developing a recipe like that, for example. But even just someone who maybe lives in the same country or state as you, but doesn't have access to fresh ingredients, for example. So always providing where it makes sense. Could I use garlic powder instead of fresh garlic cloves? For example, could I use dried parsley? What's something else altogether that might fit the bill that maybe someone could could find easily? So I feel like we all have this desire to be inclusive as possible and to make people feel valued. But this conversation, I can see where it would spark in some people, especially newer bloggers, this feeling of like, well, how can I? This is overwhelming. Like thinking of so many different foods and recipes and ways to deliver your information that you, you know, you you want to include as many people as possible, but you're you just can't do it all. So I was just hoping you could give us some encouragement. Like, of course we can't cover every single base out there in this entire universe, but we can still do this reasonably and, you know, create really good quality content that's including a lot of people. Yeah, especially for newer bloggers, I would say to start with what you have and where you are, which I think is a common refrain of advice, but specifically like with recipes that are familiar to you that you learned how to make from a family member or that you just could make you know, without measurements, you know, very easily, because you are most likely to actually be an expert on that recipe and to be able to offer a lot of valuable, fruitful information for your readers without having to engage in a ton of research or really spin your wheels. And I would also recommend starting with a strong theme or framework if you're using one of the blog frameworks or if you're fortunate enough to start with a designer from Jump is to make sure that inclusion is a part of that inclusion and accessibility. And a lot of the W3 standards of accessibility will be taken care of for you by virtue of having like a solid theme or layout. But I would also say that what you do doesn't have to look like what anybody else does in order for it to be important or helpful or truly amazing. There are so many best practices and models of success that we see of like what a good food blogger food blogger is. And even what we've talked about today, these are things that any creator or business owner can implement. Some things are truly universal, but at the core of our storytelling and our blogs is our individuality. So my encouragement to my fellow food bloggers is to bring your individuality and your authentic point of view to your work. We are each inherently worthy and somebody out there really needs to hear your voice and what you do. Oh, that was so well said. Thank you. Yeah, I feel inspired by everything you're saying. And like I said, I've said a million times, like we all want to include people and make our users feel loved and heard and all of that. So just being aware of some of the things that you are talking about is step one for a lot of us. So thank you for bringing this very important topic to the table, Jasmine. Is there anything we've forgotten to touch on before we start saying goodbye? I don't think so. I'm really glad to have been in conversation with you, Megan, and hope that this topic is helpful. It is so helpful and I think under underserved, right? So thank you again. Do you have either a favorite quote or words of inspiration to leave us with today, Jasmine? I would just reiterate that reach inherently worthy. Someone out there is really needing to hear your voice in your content. So I would remain true to that rather than trying to adopt a more generalized blogger voice or a more mainstream blogger voice and to share the recipes and the the stories that are authentic to you. Amazing. Thank you so much. We will put together show notes for you, Jasmine. If anyone wants to go look at those, you can go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash dash of jazz. Tell everyone where they can find you online and on social media, Jasmine. Yes, of course, dashofjazz.com. That's D-A-S-H-O-F-J-A-Z-Z.com is my food and travel site. And then I'm Dash of Jazz blog on every platform, Instagram, Pinterest. I love Pinterest, YouTube, and Twitter. Awesome. Go check Jasmine out, everyone. And thank you so much again for being here and sharing this information, Jasmine. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. 
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of eBlog Talk. Please share this episode with a friend who would benefit from tuning in. I will see you next time.